Ladies and gentlemen, Hebrews and Shebrews, welcome back to The Life Podcast. Today, my good friend, Nate Van Buskirk, who is also a financial consultant, but that's kind of totally beside the point because we don't get into that at all. Although you should check out his page at Van Buskirk Financial, we'll link to it, because he does such a great job in this. In this interview, he is interviewing me. We're flipping things around, and the reason we're doing that is because Nate is not a Torah observer, and he's going to ask all the questions that come to his mind when he hears of someone keeping Torah. So he's going to ask about what is our approach to grace and salvation and law and the Old and New Testament, and he's going to ask about why we don't eat pork and shellfish and our reasoning and all of the things that you, all the questions you guys probably get all the time. He is genuinely interested in, and he crafted, I think wonderfully, all of these questions together. And he's a really good interviewer. So you'll hear this, I guess, wide ranging interview, because we, we talk about capital punishment and kind of, I give my defense for that. And we also talk about, my goodness, so many other things. I'm excited for you to hear it. And without further ado, let's meet Nate. Cheers, sir. Cheers. Thanks for having me. Thanks. You're having me. I'm not having you. Uh, that's true. You're having me to your house, hmm. and I'm having you on the Life Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I've dreamt about the time when you were going to say that to me instead of getting to listen to you say it to everybody else. <laughs> Thank you for being here, bro. I'm excited. I guess we'll just have started a few minutes ago then, or a few seconds ago. You would think. But part of what, I mean, there's, there's some crossover between the life and l'chaim, because that's two life, okay. which is like l'chaim, okay. cheers in Hebrew. And so I thought that was kind of cool. I, knew, I didn't know that. Yeah. Hmm. I wanted to say something at the beginning of this episode. The whole point of this is to talk about basically what Torah observant people believe, or really what I believe. Mm -hmm. And some people who call themselves Torah observant Christians also... Yeah. I think subscribe to this. Yeah, which is what I want to know more of, I think, because yeah. I am very curious about it. Because we grew up together, mm -hmm. and I went to the church that your dad was the pastor of, mm -hmm. and we were homeschooled, just to catch everyone <laughs> up. Homeschoolers for life. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then now it's years later. And here we are, and I, I think the Torah is relevant, and most Christians don't think that, and so, yeah. Which I think, for somebody that is not Torah observant, is maybe the first question that somebody would have is like, how were you raised in a traditional Christian church? Maybe traditional is too loose of a word to use. Maybe it wasn't that traditional, but traditional values and beliefs that the Christian church holds, and now you're a Torah observant Christian. Why did you make the change, or how did you make the shift? Oh my gosh. Well, it's funny. It's usually, because I've talked to a lot of people about this, usually for them, it's not something they were seeking. Hmm. And same with me. It's not something that I was seeking out. Um, I was just living, my story is that I was just living life in New York, and my mom called me and said she wasn't celebrating Christmas that year. And I thought that that was crazy. And, but I also thought it was one of her phases, because you know how she <laughs> did dancing and stuff. Yeah. Although that was not a phase either. That mm, stuck. Yeah. She taught Hebrew dancing forever. Yeah, okay. But she would do dancing. She did all sorts of different things, and I thought she'll get over it, whatever. I'm not even going to think about it. But I, somehow I heard of it again from her. And I was like, why are you doing this? This is, doesn't make sense. Everyone else who's a Christian celebrates the birth of Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's about him. So, you know, that's crazy, yeah. and why are you doing that? And then she said, well, I don't remember exactly what she said, but I bet it was something along the lines of, um, there's no Christmas holiday in the Bible, and, uh, and Sunday and Christmas and other things were instituted way later than the first century. And so Jesus and the disciples weren't doing it. And anyway, when, when I talked to her um, about that, I started looking into it. At that time, I was an active journalist, like writing for this magazine 
in New York and I was researching all the time and I thought, I can research, I'm a journalist, I went to school for this, I know how to do this, I better use it. Yeah. And so I thought, I'm gonna disprove it. I mean, in the back of my mind, I thought, does she have any point? Yeah. But really it was, I want to show her with evidence hmm. that this is a mistake. And, and I sh showed myself that she was right. Hmm. And then I thought, all right, she's right about Christmas, but not about anything else. And then I <laughs> couldn't help myself. <laughs> yeah. But look at the other things. And it took like years because I wasn't doing this full time. I was just living. Yeah. But over a few years, I realized, okay, there are other things that um, I guess the Christian church still believes that I now think should be reformed out of the church. Hmm. And so Christmas was one. Sunday right. was one. So... We're really close to the holidays. This probably is not going to be seen or listened to until after the holidays. What are some of those other things? Like Christmas, we've uncovered that. That Tell me this, because it is really close to the holidays. Why no Christmas observance? Why is that maybe such a sticking point for somebody who is in the Torah movement? To be fair, not everyone believes that in okay. this movement. Some people are like, no, Christmas is fine. But usually when people come into this, they, they, that's one of the first things where they say, no, it's not good. And the reason is this. Christmas and Easter, for me, um, I don't observe them because they mask, they're holidays that are masquerading as biblically prescribed, but they mm. aren't anywhere in the Bible. Okay. And about biblical things, but they aren't about biblical things mm. in, at their, in a lot of their roots. Okay. At the inception. Okay. So if somebody, let's say myself, a pagan, <laughs> if I am observing the Christmas holiday just because it's a holiday, not because it's rooted in this Christian faith of maybe, I don't know, maybe you would even say the bastardization of the Christmas story for what we take it as, is that an incorrect way to spend your time? Is it a sin, would you say? Is it a, and I know that, that like, that's a heavy word because I'm asking you to say, is it a sin? But how do you, what's that like for somebody that's in the secular world? How do people in the Torah movement observe people in the secular world that celebrate Christmas? Maybe not from a religious perspective, but just because it is a socialized holiday. That's a great question. And it's really important to ask, is it a sin, I think, also. Okay. Now, first of all, for the audience, he's not actually like a Wiccan pagan. He just means... <laughs> I'm not. Not that I know of. <laughs> I guess he's loosely using that term for fun. I hope I'm using it for fun. Um, <laughs> but the reason I think it's a good idea to ask about whether it's a sin or not is... It's because that's how we started the documentary, The Christmas Question. Mm. But it was specifically for Christians, is it a sin to celebrate Christmas? Okay. Because I think for okay. non-Christians, it doesn't matter. And that's kind of what, I guess, what my question is, is, is it a sin, I suppose? I guess for non-Christians, I don't call it a, well, Paul says you can't judge those that are, that are without the church. And mm. so that's my standard. I don't judge those and hold them accountable to the, to the standards of the Bible, um, because he says, if you judge people without the, the church, then you, you couldn't live in the world. So he says, you just must judge those in the church and hold them accountable yeah. when they're doing yeah. something you think is not biblical. Yeah. So if someone's in the church, they're doing something I see as not biblical, then yes, I, I, would, I would say what my perspective is. And yes, I think it would be a sin to celebrate it, um, okay. which is a rough, place to stand and and I had to have to be able to defend it but I made a whole documentary about it so yeah it's called the Christmas question if anyone wants to see it go it's watch on it YouTube. go watch it <laughs> so tell me more about obviously you had your mom kind of uncovers this way of life that she wants to subscribe to she really believes you try to disprove it you start proving it to yourself that oh maybe she is right along your journey what were what was maybe one of the bigger epiphanies that you were like, this, I need to transition the way that I'm living right now into this more Torah observant lifestyle. And I guess even Luke, like describing what Torah life is for you, I guess, so that we have a little bit more of a context of why observe it. But I guess 
Yeah, start with, start with yeah, start with why you observe it. I'll remind you of the other question. I feel like that was lengthy. Why I observe it? Yeah, I think for me, even starting to look into this and explore it was because I love Yah or God so much that I wanted to be useful to Him, hmm. and that was my prayer before looking into this. Was literally, I want to be a tool so sharp that you won't put me down, and that was because. I realized at that point in New York that he was real and good. And I wanted at that point to do everything I could to like serve him. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I was praying that. And that happened to be when I started learning all this stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think that then when I saw that at least I had proved to myself that this stuff is true, then you can't, un I couldn't unsee it. And I still had the desire to want to serve him, so it was natural that I would live it. Hmm. And so that's why I started living it. Because once you think, okay, I'm trying to do what he wants me to do, and his Bible, the word says to do these things, then it, it's natural to, to say, okay, then I should do them. So you're living in New York. You and Katie are married at this time? No. You're not married at this time. What were her thoughts? Like, what was what was that like? Because, yeah, just describing that to somebody else who obviously you're intertwined with, but saying, hey, that's like this is a pretty big overhaul to bring to somebody. And, like, I think that maybe we're doing this wrong and we need to do it a different way. Man, well, we weren't married and we weren't engaged yet. But okay. shortly after that, I asked her to marry me. And she asked her parents... Actually, I think she asked him before this, thank goodness, because she said yes. Yeah. But she, she um, asked them, he, what, do you, what should I do? He believes this stuff, mm -hmm. which we think is false. Yeah. And um, should I not date him anymore, basically? Hmm. And they asked her three questions. They said, does he love God? And she said, yes, he does. Will he change? Have you seen him change his behavior if he thinks he's wrong about something? Hmm. Basically, if, if this is proved to be wrong, will he change it? She yeah. yes. And then, I can't remember what the third thing is. She would know. Um, like, does he listen to the Holy Spirit or something? I don't does know. he change his underwear every day? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, she said yes. And they said, it doesn't matter. He'll basically come around to huh. to okay. realizing that it's, he's crazy. So, yeah. So, like almost like you'll be relieved of this belief or this choice that you've made it's okay. like eventually he'll find the <laughs> truth out about it and okay. she felt like that too yeah we got married and even before we got married like i was still going through this thing like figuring out yeah because we got married on shabbat saturday which i never would have done after fully coming hmm. into this because okay. i wouldn't employ people on that day okay. yeah yeah and so um yeah i was still coming into it and then we started talking about it like at length after we got married yeah and i and I always knew that she would agree eventually, but yeah. she didn't when we got married. Okay. But I knew she was smart and I knew that she loved God. And yeah. so I knew that eventually I, th I thought she would see the same way. This episode of the Life Podcast is brought to you by The Way Documentary, The Truth, Reformation 2.0 Apologetics Book, and Truth Tracks. The Way Documentary tells the story of our movement. This is the story of people who were trading Easter ham for Passover lamb and Sunday church for Saturday Sabbath, all in an effort to live like their savior. It dives into their stories through their own voices and into the history and theology that show how the church got to where it is today. The Truth, Reformation 2.0 is the only book of its kind, an all-encompassing theological treatise that answers every question a mainstream Christian might have about why you want to keep Torah. And finally, truth tracks are small comics beautifully illustrated that use stories and scripture to remind Christians that once we are saved by grace through faith, we are called to live and do the instructions of Yah, his Torah. If you want to learn more about any of these products, go to thewaydoc.com. That's the way, D-O-C, like documentary.com. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm so curious about this because I did not realize the timeline because it's strange to say, but in the Torah observance, would marrying somebody outside of that almost be like an unequally yoked 
or I'm just so curious if, because you're still coming into this way of thinking in this lifestyle. And yet you're marrying somebody who not necessarily, obviously you converted her. So <laughs> I didn't ever convert. Her. Here's the crazy thing about that. I'll tell you about that first. And then I'll answer the question yeah. about unequally yoked. Um, she didn't believe anything I said. She didn't agree. She thought yeah. I was wrong. And she may still to this day have felt that way, but she had a dream. Huh. And she tells the dream better, but basically she was meeting at a Bible study in the dream with all of her friends that went to college with her. And there in the Bible study was like a crazy evil looking demon. And he was just sitting in the Bible study with them. And hmm. everyone was hanging out with the demon. And she said, don't you guys see that there's this evil demon amongst us? Huh. And they're like, he's whatever. They're not even he's fine. Like they didn't even address or notice this. Yeah. And it was very scary to her and visceral. And when she woke up, she knew immediately like in her spirit that she was um, not calling things sin that were sin. Huh. And so that was what everything boiled down yeah. to for her about yeah. this way of belief. Wow. So it must have been very powerful for her, obviously, to have that experience and to make a change based off of a dream. Yeah, it was powerful enough that she, yes, yeah, she... And I guess I would say dream. I think dream almost dumbs it down because I think that we've all had dreams that have been that powerful to us that it has made either a change or a shift in perspective. So sometimes saying a dream almost, I think, waters it down for what it actually is. Yeah, yeah. Mm. It was real to her, though. And so she yeah. felt like... And it wasn't just the dream. I think it was the post-dream where she had the realization that, okay, yeah, yeah. that's what this means. Yeah. And okay, mm -hmm. this is right. But, I mean, since that time, I hope to think that she's also just thought that it's right. And she has. I mean, yeah. it, it wasn't... Yeah. That was just the gateway for her to be able to listen and yeah. discuss things. Yeah. Hmm. You mentioned in her dream people not calling sin a sin or what that is. What does that look like from the Torah observance? And I guess the, like in a, in a very stereo, stereotypical generalized sense, there are obviously things that you believe are a sin that either a Christian or somebody who's in a different religion, Catholicism, whatever that is, would not adhere to those beliefs. What are some of those? Okay, I think there's like four main ones. Okay. It's the observing, in your diet, observing the Leviticus 11 food laws. That's like one of them. And then observing the Saturday Sabbath. Well, you do, what okay. are the food laws? Just for those of us who Basically, really may not no know. no pork and shellfish. Okay. I mean, for, for our westernized palate, yeah, okay. it's no pork and shellfish. Okay. And catfish, too. Okay. But for the rest of the world, it's also no dog or cat or whatnot. Okay. I mean, or bat. Luckily, I don't find, <laughs> we don't find ourselves. No, no one goes to bat for bat. In, in Ohio or, or the United States. I yeah. course, I've yeah. pointed that out before. But so, all right, food laws. Okay. The Sabbath being the seventh day, not the first okay. day, yeah. Sunday. Um, goodness, will I even remember them all? The feast days, like okay. celebrating yeah. the, the feast days as described in Leviticus 23 mm -hmm. rather than feast days yeah. that aren't in the Bible. Yeah. And. Goodness, what's the last thing? Maybe just tassels, wearing okay. mm -hmm. fringes of blue okay. on the four corners of your of your clothing. Yeah. And okay. I think those are the main things. There, there's probably more. On what it. about mixed fabrics? Is that a thing, like wearing mixed fabrics? There's a debate about it because okay. it says linen and wool in that verse. It mm. says mixed fabrics, linen and wool. Okay. Which is like... Shimini arets in okay. Hebrew. I'm okay. butchering that, but okay. so some people just say it's just linen and wool, like they used to wear Lindsay Woolsey back in the front. Oh yeah, 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 okay. So that would be a direct contradiction of don't wear that. Okay. So some people say it's just that, and some people say it's all mixed fabrics, and some people think you shouldn't even wear polyester. I mean, okay. not that that's a law, yeah. but that is just not healthy. Do you mind me asking what you do? I I wear 100 percent everything. Okay. 100 percent natural polyester. fibers. <laughs> now you could do 100 percent polyester and okay. be within the bounds of sure of the verse but to honestly i feel like when i if i put on something polyester mm -hmm. and this might just be me because i have a very thomas my brother says i have a very active i don't know imagination where yeah. I, I i'll think something in my head and then i'll <laughs> viscerally feel it yeah so i will feel like 
I feel terrible. Yeah. I can't wear this. Okay. And so it, that's more me than it is yeah. the Bible, I yeah, think. I understand that. The first suit that I ever purchased, it was really cheap. I had no money. And it was polyester. Like I, I couldn't afford wool or something else. And I remember I wore it to a funeral and it was in the summer and like I sweat buckets. So I also have a hatred of polyester. <laughs> Not maybe for religious beliefs, but <laughs> due to uncomfortability, I suppose. And uh, yeah, yeah. And so I wouldn't make the case that biblically you can't wear polyester, but I would say I don't like doing it. No. Yeah, okay. And that we should probably remind everyone that that's what all yeah. of this is. I, mean, I can't speak for all the people sure, that sure. might yeah. think. But. So Luke, what do you say to the person that's like, so you're, you're, I guess the two biggest things that would affect somebody of a different religious background or maybe not religion at all is not eating pork shellfish. Why is that a sticking point for you or maybe for somebody else that believes the same in the Torah movement? So I don't know if I'd even call it a sticking point. I would just say that when you re when I realized See, it goes back to who you see yourself as. Mm -hmm. It goes back to your identity. Mm -hmm. Everything, all of doing this, goes back to the fact that all these people think that they are grafted in spiritual Israel. Mm -hmm. Because that's what Paul says in Ephesians 2. Okay. He said, you were once Gentiles in the flesh, but now you have become grafted into the commonwealth of the house of Israel. Mm -hmm. So, And that goes back to the split of the southern and northern kingdom of Israel mm -hmm. after Solomon. Yeah. Um, but having this idea that you are spiritual Israel leads, in this movement at least, to people thinking, well, what were the instructions for Israel? And those are the Torah. Those are the laws mm -hmm. in the Bible. And so I think then added on top of that, the doubling down of the definition of sin being the Torah, the law, in the New Testament. First John 3, 4 says, sin is transgression of the law, like breaking of the law. Mm -hmm. And a good case can be made that the law he's talking about is the Torah, the old school okay, law. Yeah. And so, and then Paul says the same thing, I think in Romans 3, if I'm not misquoting, he said, I wouldn't have known sin if not for the law. Hmm. He, I wouldn't have known, I can't remember what example he gives, but maybe fornication or something, for, okay. if not for the law. Okay. And then because the law showed it to me. Mm. And so multiple times in the New Testament it's repeated that this is sin. And so because the law defines sin, then if you just look through the law with a closer view, you'll see that there's a few things that the law defines as sin that we in a modern Western church have for some reason left behind. And... There's a lot of history in why that happened. Do you mind enlightening me? In the, I, I know that you probably don't want to give a history lesson, but why were those rules or why was that law left behind? And it's kind of like, hey, we can eat bacon and pork chops and ham for Easter, actually, which is kind of ironic. It but, is ironic. Like, if, if you don't mind. Yes, it was Passover lamb <clears throat> and then Easter ham, right, at the same time. Mm -hmm. Same. Yeah. Which is interesting. But, okay, yes. I would love to tell you everything I can. Now, I'm not the end all be all source of this, yeah. and, but I have thought deeply about if I did another documentary, it should be about the history of the church. Specifically, the history of the church that came to conclusions that changed the belief from the first century. Mm -hmm. in, yeah, not even in my opinion, just history. That's what yeah, I want. Yeah. And so a few points of that which we can visit really quickly that will show why the church at large distanced itself from what it called as like Jewish things mm -hmm. would be like the council, first council of Nicaea where, mm -hmm. where they decide that Easter should be on this specific day instead of calculating it. Because they said b before some people, the quarter decimans were calculating Passover um, just like the Jewish people were based on the, the moon cycle. Mm -hmm. And people in this movement will have totally different views on how to calculate that. But back then, that's what they were debating. Um, the quarter decimans were doing that, and that's annoying, and it's also Jewish. And we don't want to in any way be like these Jewish people. Mm. Like, these are the words I'm quoting from the Council of Nicaea. 
and they have all sorts of anti-Semitic like vitriol against the J Jewish people mm -hmm. because you know they these Christians are this new religion that are coming out of Israel really and the surrounding area and they're getting the Jews are getting persecuted in that point after the destruction of the temple in yeah. 70 AD and so anyway they're distancing themselves from Jews in general and the church itself distanced itself from Jewish, what it calls Jewish festivals and observations. Mm -hmm. And so in that, that's the beginning of no more Passover and now Easter. Okay. One, it's easier to calculate. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's like the 14th day after the full moon, sort of the full moon, the first Sunday after the full moon, okay. and after the spring equinox, something like that. I can't okay. remember. But so there's Easter. Sunday is similar. We're on March, I think, 7, 321 AD. Constantine makes this Sunday law where, where he says that Sunday is now the Sabbath day for Christians. Now, there are other things that led up to that and predated that. But that's when the corporate church officially and on paper and histor historically adopts Sunday. And then later on, he says, actually, if you keep Saturday, now you're anathema from the church. Hmm. And so that's some of the history of why those two big things like, were, were, were lost. Okay. Other than that, I think it was a general desire to distance the, Christian, the new Christians from what was seen as Judaism. And okay. not as Christianity. Okay. But it's in the same... The thing is, the, the crossover is that it's in the same book. We share yeah. that book. Yeah. And so hmm. that's where we start losing, in my opinion, um, consistency in our beliefs and logic even. Okay. When we start saying, well, not, we're not going to do this from the Old Testament, but we will do the tithe, for example. Okay. Or we will do whatever else. Because there's a... T Christians, for the record, mainstream Christians, are doing like the majority of the law already. Mm -hmm. So that's why I've just pointed out four things that are the main differences between okay. them. Because they're already doing most of the law. Yeah. And some of it is only in the Old Testament that, we're do that they're doing. It's yeah. not repeated okay. in the New. Like bestiality is not repeated in the New. And several other things that are slipping my mind yeah. that all Christians would be like, I'm not going <laughs> to do bestiality. <laughs> yeah. and, but it's not repeated in the New Testament, mm -hmm. but... Okay. But I'm not going to do it. So, I mean, I think that the only consistent perspective, whatever you call it, call it Torah observant, don't, whatever you want to call it, if you think that the, the law is relevant, is to just apply it all. And so that's where you get the food laws and the Sabbath and the feasts and the whole yeah. nine yards. Yeah. So as a person that is unaware of some of these things... <clears throat> I think that, and most people are not, this Torah movement, like it's pretty small, it's growing, but it's small, smaller than your mainstream religions. Yeah. I am not anti-Semitic. Um, maybe I choose to celebrate the Sabbath on a Sunday. Maybe I choose to eat pork. Is it, is it just because the law says that I shouldn't do those things, which is why I shouldn't do that? Or is my ignorance bliss in the fact that, well, I don't know any better, so therefore it can't hurt me? So you're asking, do you need to have the knowledge of the sin for it to be a sin? Or, or, yeah, or, or, or maybe. Or just a person that's like from the Christian movement of, is it semantics? If you choose to celebrate Shabbat and I choose to take Sunday off, and let's say even say that they're celebrated the same, I don't employ people, I observe it the same way, I think that maybe a lot of people on the outside of the tour movement would maybe say that it's semantics. Like, why is your way different? And is it just from the interpretation of the law, or is it something else? You're probably like, right. Most people would probably say it's semantics, and yeah. it's not a big deal, and... Um, I guess I should also make it clear that I don't think that doing these like four or five other things are something that are in any way related to salvation. Mm. 
I think that I was going to ask you about that later. Sorry, I scooped that. <laughs> no, no, no. I think that it's it's great because I I think that it's an important question for a lot of people who are listening to this that maybe aren't familiar with this. Like, so if you want to get into that right now, let's I'll pour, just say let's pour gas on the fire. I believe we're saved by grace through faith, that not of ourselves, mm -hmm. gift of God, not of works, specifically not of works that any man may boast, because all of us have sinned, mm -hmm. and I think inherited sin. Mm -hmm. And so we are toast. And, um, and so, but for the blood of Yeshua and mm -hmm. the grace of his father, of Yah, that he, that he would allow us to be covered with his blood and welcomed into his kingdom mm -hmm. in that way. So that's how I see salvation. I see yep. the grace, period. I see grace here and I see law here. I see them as separate things. I see law as instructions on how you should live. Okay. The instructions of life. And so, so do Christians. I mean, mm -hmm. mainstream Christians. Sure. They see it all, but they just say it's moral law. And I just say a few other things are part of that moral law. Hmm. And I mean, I think all of the law is moral because Yah is moral and he yeah. wrote it. But I understand that not everything can apply to us in our modern way, in our modern yeah. life. So, and I'm not asking you to be the mouthpiece of the whole Torah movement because everybody has their different epiphanies, their different opinions, philosophies, whatever that may be. And some might, sorry, and some might say that you have to keep the law to be saved, even though I don't, yeah. I can't find that in the Torah. And that's what I was going to ask. Okay. So if let's say saved by grace, yeah. so I'm saved by grace, the law is something that is to be observed. Am what is the thought of you? And again, not asking you to speak for the whole movement of salvation. If we're saved by grace, if I am saved by grace, yet I'm not upholding any of the Torah laws. Am I ushered into the afterlife? Any of the Torah laws would mean like, and I guess, murder yeah, and all yeah, that well. yeah. So let me be more specific. Like maybe like the four, four yes, I was going to say the four pillars, let's quote unquote that you mentioned. If I'm not observing any of those, what is your opinion on, am I getting into heaven as the afterlife, or am I not because I have not observed the law? See, I don't see it related to salvation, so I would say you're, st you're saved, you're going to the afterlife. But at the same time, <laughs> I mean, on top of that, I think we are also held culpable for yeah. what we do know and are convinced of. Yeah. So if you know and you're convinced of these things and you're not doing it because it's inconvenient, mm -hmm. then that must have something, some level of bearing on what Yah thinks of you because he wants people that I assume, and I think he says that he wants people that will, that fear him and, and will do what he wants. So I, I like to hope that all believers, all Christians and Torah observant believers are only doing the things that they think God wants them to do. Mm -hmm. So if they're convinced of that and they don't do it, I don't know. That's definitely not yeah. right. It's not a, it, it, it's definitely sinning. Yeah. Um, but I see the law hooked to sanctification. Mm -hmm. That's the, the theological buzzword. Yeah. So grace, salvation, law, sanctification. Yeah. And I think Christians think the same thing because lifestyle is how you're sanctified or basically made more like Yeshua. Yeah. So that's how I see it. And I won't step into the place of judgment and be like, I will say that you're damned. Yeah. Because... I think that there are people in this movement who are doing other sins, sadly, that they know or don't know about. Mm -hmm. And I hope that that won't keep them from salvation. Yeah. So, same thing. I, they would think it's a sin. I would think it's a sin. But then, okay. I mean, will any of us be completely spotless? Do we have to like say the sinner's prayer on our right when we're dying? Yeah. yeah. I mean, this, this gets into other debates. Yeah. But mm. I just see it as sin. I see it as sanctification. Keeping the law is sanctification, basically. Yeah. Becoming more like the image of God, like we were created. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question or not. It does. No, I think that it absolutely does. It brings up another question. You mentioned like the fear of God or wanting people to fear God as the creator the, of the universe. How I think that a lot of times religious views are broken down into maybe... There are a lot of subcategories, but let's say two categories. One, fear. People join a religious movement because they're fear-based. I have to do these things because I don't want, you know, 
burning in this fiery pit of hell or otherwise I think that you could also claim like wealth and riches is another thing. It's like, I want my mansion in heaven. Like I remember hearing that when I was younger and it's like, both of those are kind of like, yeah, I don't cringy. really lie. Yeah, it is cringy. That's a good way to phrase it. It's, it's a cringy way to phrase that. How would you view if we have fear on this side, wealth and riches on this side, where would you align the Torah movement? Like what is the Torah movements? Like if there's a buzzword or a sticking point for what you are promised or what you're getting or what you're avoiding, what is that? For me, and I hope for a lot of people believing this, it's of course love. I mean, you're doing mm. the things out of love. And that's mm. the same thing the mainstream church will say. It's that there is love is the motivating factor mm -hmm. in why we're living the way we're living and doing what we're doing. And all, and fear, I think, is brought up and it's almost Christianese where it's not fear like I'm scared of fire. Yeah, It's fear as in Ecclesi the end of Ecclesiastes, where he says the whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. Mm -hmm. And if you zoom in on the word fear, what does fear mean in this context? Because it's our whole duty. It's not to, to cringe mm. <laughs> from fire. Yeah. It is to have reverence and respect. Mm. I, to give a short yeah. definition. Yeah. And that, I believe, is... Is, is, is the kind of fear that I'm talking yeah. about. And I think the fear that's good and healthy and necessary for any believer. Because if you don't have that, then why do you believe what you're believing? Why, why, would, why would you change your life? Why would you do yeah. anything yeah. differently? And mm. I think that's the same thing with all of the Torah is, is like, why are people doing this? Because, well, their creator wrote for them a code of sovereign morality. And so why would they try and rewrite that or improve upon it or take mm -hmm. anything away from it? And I think that's the main gist is let's take what he has because it's sovereign, yeah. not what the Methodists have created and taken away some of the sovereign bits or yeah. the Episcopalians or any of the other churches. Because mm -hmm. if you think about it, there are now there was the Methodist view of, of what was morality and that just split like a couple of years ago Yeah, where the Methodists said, okay, I, we can ordain LGBT pastors and we can also marry them. And then the other half said, no, we can't. Mm -hmm. And one said it's loving to do it. And one said, no, it's not loving to do it. Yeah. And so that means the definition of love that the Methodist church together has created is not sovereign. Okay. It's not consistent. Mm -hmm. It's relative. Yeah. And so that's what I think is attractive about the Torah in general. It's that... One, you can defer to the fact that Yah created it and you didn't pen this. Mm -hmm. You're not like, I'm hating gays. Yeah. And so I'm penning these rules about LGBTQ yeah. people. Yeah. No, you're saying, well, Yah has his, his views of what creates life and what leads to life and what leads to death. And that's what all of the Torah things boil down to. Yeah. From my perspective. Okay. So like if something can lead to life, it's great. And it's... If something can lead to death or does lead to death, then it's okay. It's bad. <laughs> but love is kind of that defining characteristic of this movement. Goodness. I think the hard part here is us saying this movement because love is the defining characteristic of Yah, I think. Mm -hmm. He is love. And love is the defining... It, he would want love to be the defining characteristic of his people. I hope that the Torah movement is full of his people. Mm -hmm. I'm sure some of them aren't, sadly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, and I'm sure that many of them have acted in ways that aren't loving to their fa friends and family, mm -hmm. sadly, yeah. and have turned them off from the things that are loving from the Creator yeah. and the things that will lead them into life from the Creator. So, the whole Torah thing is just a, it's a Christian that realizes and has this switch in their brain. Mm -hmm. That, that God has more things that are bring, going to benefit them. Yeah. And, and more things that will shape them into his image. Yeah. And, and then couple that with a love for him to do with them. And mm. so that, that's yeah. how I see. Yeah. And that's like maybe the rosy view. But that mm -hmm. is, the reason, people aren't, mostly people aren't just doing this to be um, countercultural or sure. obnoxious. Some of them might be. <laughs> <laughs> There's always those few. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, I hope it's Pew. <laughs> I think most people just are doing it out of genuinely being convinced that this is right and that, that it, it really is how Yah wants us to live. Yeah. Yeah. I think very well said, first of all. Oh, thanks. I have read your book, The Truth. I see it. Which it's, there, yes, it's actually, and that was not planned. That literally really? sits on that table all the time. I did not. That if was I not can like a zoom prop. in on this, I will. I and know. I would suggest everybody read it. I thought that it was a really good read. Um, you do a really deep dive into why you believe what you believe. Thanks, but there's man. also like coming from every religion, people are observing those religious beliefs because they believe that it is absolute truth. They're the the. Catholics believe the way that they do because, and they, in a theory, whether it be loose or not, and I'm not just using Catholicism, I'm even using them as an example, Christianity, any other religious view believes that they are truth, that what they have is the truth. What defines this movement as being different? And maybe I'm movement, maybe that's wrong. I don't know, you can correct oh. me, or observance, or whatever that is. What makes this different in the fact? Because I guess that even in writing a book that is called The Truth, I think that's a very bold statement to make, which I applaud. I admire that. Um, but why everybody, I'm guessing that I'm saying everybody has come to their conclusion that what I'm doing is the truth, it is right. What differentiates this observance movement from every other religion? Okay. We're calling the podcast The Life. Mm -hmm. The book's the truth. Yeah. The doc was the way. Yeah. So it's the way, the truth, and the life, which comes from Yeshua. Because he is, he said of himself, self-described, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he says, no man comes to the Father but by me. And then he says later, I am the door. And, and he's, I won't quote the whole thing because I'll won't. i butcher it. Sadly. <laughs> I think it's if any man hears my voice and knocks, I will let him in and sup yeah. with him and something like that. Anyway, yeah. so he states multiple times that he's the only way to the being, the entity, yeah. the great designer, the creator. And so because we believe that his words and the book, the Bible, um, we, we believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And so just same as Christians. I mean, we're convinced that the words in the Bible are from God. And because we're convinced of that, then we just live out as best we can those actions. And I don't know if that answers your question. What was your full question again? Because I don't think it does. Yeah, I guess that my question was more pointed towards everybody has come to this oh, yeah. determination that what they are believing is truth. How do we know ours is true? Yeah. Okay. Well, I've been convinced that the Bible itself is true. Mm -hmm. And so starting from that, then how do we interpret it? Mm -hmm. Should I get into why I think the Bible's true? Because... Yeah, why not? Okay. Open that can of worms. <clears throat> because that is... That's what it all comes back to. Mm -hmm. Sadly, like, my dad does not believe that the Bible is... Well, he believes a lot of it is true and inspired mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it resonates and it's right. But he thinks that since it was written by men, it's not trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And he's had a lot of bad experiences with people who called themselves believers and, yeah. and when he, in his younger days. And so I think it made him think, well, I think that, there, that it's open to, it's dangerous to think that mm -hmm. this is God breathed when it's words that were literally written by men. Yeah. And so that's why, you know, the mainstream view is that it's God-inspired. Mm -hmm. And that's what I subscribe to. Yeah. I, I brought up his perspective just because he, he's not alone. And I think I think similarly to your dad, in all honesty, so I can understand and identify with that. I guess that I see both ways. But I think that I identify heavily with your dad. So w during my younger days is when I was searching and, like, trying to find out. And I had multiple interesting experiences and I guess connections mm -hmm. with the spiritual world or with a world that's not physical, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. that helped me realize that one, there's a creator mm -hmm. and two, I believe it's the creator described in the, in the Bible. And 
I had a crazy experience in Switzerland and some, you know, whole spiritual thing. Will you share what that is? I mean, I think anybody that's listening to this is going to find this very interesting. He needs to take a drink of water apparently before he answers this, but I'm curious. I have never heard this story before. Okay. This was my, you know, when you're young, or at least when I was young, I would go to church everyone would pray and we'd praise and we'd do all this stuff and sometimes you would feel like some kind of presence of the Holy Spirit or something Mm -hmm. like that but besides that I never spoke in tongues I didn't have any of that kind of stuff never came naturally to me it wasn't something that happened even though I prayed that I would Mm -hmm. speak in tongues you know we went to charismatic church and it's like I wanted to speak in tongues really badly but I never did agreed I never made the major leagues (laughs) so I felt like I was just evil or something I didn't know what was up yeah (laughs) so I mean but it was always kind of trying to I think as you get older I was 16 at this time I think but when you're 16 17 you start to look around and try and figure out like all right, that's what I grew up with, and I felt something interesting there, something weird and crazy, this, yeah, the yeah. Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call it. But I never had any, like, I didn't see miracles. I didn't see, I didn't have any direct connection or anything. Mm-hmm. And so when I was in Switzerland, I was traveling with my cousin Pepe and my sister Rebecca, and we were walking in the Pyrenees Mountains. Actually, we were in France, in southern France. We were right at the border of Spain, and... Um, it was getting dark and cold and I just prayed. I said, cause I was in this very, I feel like travel for me, extended travel has been all, almost always connected to a time of searching out mm, yeah. like spiritual existential stuff. Yes. And whether I'm writing while I'm doing it or mm. praying. And so we're in nature and I'm praying and it's getting cold and we had left our tents and all of our stuff at this train stop and it was at this point when we needed to re- to either go up into the mountains and decide to sleep under the stars mm. and it looked like it was going to rain without tents or anything okay yeah just with sleeping bags or go back and get our stuff and like be properly prepared we were not the best prepared kids <laughs> at 16 i'm sure but on the way in i'm praying and i had this fe- i said i said god we I want to remember exactly what I said. It was something like, I've prayed to you and heard about you my whole life. Are Mm -hmm. you real? And will you show yourself to me? Hmm. And I felt like he, he something said, yes. And I said, then will you take care of us? Hmm. Let's just, will, will you take care of us if we keep going and not turn back and not do the thing, which was smart to get the tent. Yeah. And he said, yes. Or the being or feeling or whatever, or my own subconscious, whatever you want to say. Sure. And I thought, all right, all right. So either I'm telling myself yes, or he's saying yes, but yes is the go. Mm -hmm. And so we're not going back for the tents. And so I argued against Pepe, don't go back for the tents. Let's keep going into the mountains, even though it looks like it's going to rain. And it's getting darker. So we keep going. And it starts to rain. And we get up into the hills and the mountains. And... Fog rolls in that's so thick that I can't see from like me to you. So like wow. six feet, eight yeah, feet. Yeah. And we go into this field and it's raining lightly. And we hear like this dong, dong, dong of these bells. And I have no idea what it is. Little bells. Mm-hmm. And then we come upon like a cow with a, okay. like a big bell on his neck. Yeah. And then more cows. So imagine a field huh. full of okay. like 100, 200 yeah. cows. Like a giant field in, in the mountains. Huh full of these cows, but you can't see them until you get close to them. And so we're hearing the dongs, and but we're like, all right, this is beautiful and insane, but, yeah. but where are we going to sleep? <laughs> yeah. And so, so we come upon a little creek, and then we follow that creek to a hut, a shepherd's hut, literally. Hmm. We, on the door of the hut, in like eight languages, is this message, and one of them is English, and it says... Any travelers who are coming through here are welcome to stay in this hut and use in this. It's a shepherd's hut and use it. And we went there and we, he had just if you take anything, no, don't take anything, please. And like if you want to leave something for the next guest, do. Yeah. And so we did. And we went there and we, he had pasta there and we hmm. had other 
preparations that we could do. And we made a great meal and we stayed there and it was one of the most memor memorable events in my entire life. Yeah. And I knew then when we read the sign that that was the him, Yah, taking care of us. And so that was the first instance where I had like a communication with yeah. something that I believed was the creator. Mm -hmm. And and he he lived up to it. Hmm. And I had other experiences. In New York, I was dating this girl that was cross-eyed when she was a kid and she got healed in a church. Hmm. And she showed me the picture of when she was cross-eyed as a kid because I didn't really believe her yeah. still. And she showed me hmm. the picture of, and that she was healed. And so... I, all these things compounded to, and then also as you pray, you you form like a relationship with him, or I did. Sure. And so all those things came together to make me have a stronger and stronger faith. Until I was in New York, and I was praying to be used as a tool for him, and I was deciding to leave my old and evil lifestyle yeah. behind. I'm 25 years old at that point. Yeah. But the lifestyle was chasing women yeah. and women that as the most important thing on earth. Yeah. Like whole hundred percent. Yeah. And, and then deciding, all right, will I do this forever? Or is, should I, I mean, I have to make the decision. Mm -hmm. Should I follow him or not? And I decided, yeah. yes, I want to follow him. Mm -hmm. And that, that was another like very spiritual experience yeah, when sure. I, I told you about that one. I think. Yeah, yeah. And so those things compounded to make me believe. And so it's like, events maybe it's because i'm kind of like the, this creative yeah. sort where where it's the spiritual thing and the events that resonate yeah. with me yeah hmm. but those things resonated with me and then on top of that i had this study i read yeah. the, this book man what is the name of it the case for christ and in it though the most important part is when he talks about the people that believed jesus and believed that message were either lying or they really believed it. And if they really believed, they did really believe it because they died for yeah, it. Yeah. So he points that out and he points a bunch of other stuff out that made me realize, oh yeah, he's right. He's right. Mm -hmm. I mean, and there are a ton of other things that I probably can't quote off the top of my, my head mm -hmm. to give, to kind of bolster the integrity of the 66 books of the Bible. Yeah. And, and, and New Testament, Old Testament, and the veracity of that being genuine at least, mm -hmm. um, all that came together to make me think, okay, the Bible's true. I believe in this creator that's described. And thus, I got to try and do what he says. Yeah. Hmm. That was a mouthful. Sorry. No, I think that it's a beautiful story. Oh. And I think that a lot of people have stories like that. I have a lot of stories like that where I had experiences. But for some reason, I landed on the skeptical <laughs> side of it more so maybe than the believing side of it than you did. I did for a while. I did for a little while until I was like 25. That's when I had to, yeah. that was the turning point. Yeah. Hmm. I'm curious about yours too. Yeah. I had a lot. I feel like I had a lot at least, you know, growing up in church, especially a charismatic church. It was always the gifts of the spirit and yeah, something that was always ready and available, but for some reason, I was always skeptical. Still am skeptical. Um, to a great extent, I suppose. What do you think, Luke, as you telling that story and you get to this hut and it's this place of shelter and you're reading a sign that's like, I viewed that as incredibly welcoming. You're in the rain, you're in the fog, you don't have a view of more than six feet in front of you. And all of a sudden, you happen on this place it's almost is like a fairy tale, so to speak. What would you say to people who don't feel invited into the Torah realm because of the rules? It's like, ah, oh, maybe I don't fit the criteria or maybe I don't believe this yet. What would you say to somebody that's on the outside of belief that this is the lifestyle that they want to abide by right now? I guess I'd say two things. One, I don't want to convert people to it. Sure. But two... I, if they look into it for themselves, if they look into what is sin and what's not sin as defined by the Bible, then I would just hope that whatever they find, that that's what they'll do. I, I would hope that if they look into why Leviticus 11 and Leviticus 23 are just forgotten, but the rest, most of the rest of the, the, the Old Testament is still remembered, 
I, I hope that they would ask those questions of why, why is that? Why did it, why did, why was that bit of the law abolished at the cross mm -hmm. or fulfilled at the cross? Why was, why were the food laws fulfilled at the cross and not fornication? Like mm -hmm. it would be much more convenient to be able to sleep with everyone <laughs> sure. than, than eat pork, <laughs> you know? Yeah. How true. I never thought about that. <laughs> So I just asked them to ask these questions, read the Bible, and then have one rule. Try to have a belief that doesn't contradict itself, a doctrine that doesn't contradict itself. Mm. And so that's what the truth is all about, the book. And, it, and I mean, that's kind of the framework that I hope that the people in this movement are, are, are doing yeah. as well. I mean, there's that. That's one thing I wanted to say. The other thing I wanted to say, which might be a mind trip, and probably is unnecessary, but I'm, I've been thinking about it lately, so I got to say it, that the first sin described in the Bible is Eve eating of the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. She's eating the fruit of the knowledge of mm -hmm. good and evil. Sure. And she's ingesting the knowledge of good and evil. And what is the knowledge of good and evil? I would say that the the laws of God, which describe what good is and what evil is, are the knowledge of good and evil. Mm. So when I think that when she ate the fruit, the first sin, mm -hmm. because it was a sin, because God said, don't eat the fruit, and she ate the fruit, which was going against his command, which yeah. was don't eat the fruit. Yeah. She, her eyes were opened, as it says, mm -hmm. to the knowledge of what was good and what was evil. So that you have to have the knowledge of of yeah. what is a sin and what is not a sin in order to avoid sin. And so the Torah, the law, it just outlines what is good and what is evil so that you won't sin. Mm -hmm. And that's how we can boil it down. And people will debate on what sin we can even accomplish in our modern age. But any sin I think that we can accomplish in our modern age should be avoided. Yeah. And I guess that's my belief. Yeah. And that's what I would say to anyone looking into this. Okay. Just that. And, and what they land on, as long as they're honest, is what they land on. And, and, and the search of looking for it, I think, will be rewarded because it means that you love him. Mm -hmm. Wanting to know what he wants you to do is a beautiful thing. Yeah. And it means that you love him. So yeah. however people land, some people will land and they'll say, I think that it's fine to wear like mixed fabrics because it's not literally linen and wool. Yeah. And... and Great. And some people will say, I only wear cotton and wool and <laughs> yeah. silk and screw everything else. Yeah. And also I feel better, yeah. you know? And so yeah. great, great. Like, just be honest. Yeah. Be honest. And so that's what I would, that's my suggestion. Yeah. Well said. Thank you for sharing. Well, I don't know, man. I mean, you know, if, if yeah. Thanks. It was well said regardless. <laughs> thanks, Nate. Yeah. You're the man. Well, I think oh. that religions oftentimes ostracize. We have a tendency of saying like, I've been enlightened. And if you haven't been enlightened, you're less than. And I think that Luke, that's why I admire you so much is because you and I spend time with each other. We have differing views or opinions, but never once in your presence have I ever felt like I'm less than or like, oh, he's just not, he hasn't had the epiphany that I have, or he hasn't had the awakening that I have had. Praise and I think even though, even though it's not your goal to convert, there's something about that that makes it appealing to connect with this thought process, even if you don't believe it, as opposed to kicking it to the curb. Because it's, it's really easy to avoid. You know, when there are people killing each other in the name of religion, it's really easy to avoid that. I don't want any part of that. That's easy. It's more of a thought process to entertain something if you know that somebody is sincere and genuine by how they have come about their belief system, even if it's something that maybe you don't agree with yet, which I think is why I admire you as well as your family. You know, I know the rest of your family as well. I think that that's why I admire all of you so much is because you have a way of being very steadfast in your beliefs and you guys all research everything to the point where it's like it blows my mind, which is very oh, impressive. True. It's really impressive. Yet there's there's never this element of judgment, which I think is really important as well. Praise your all, man. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, I agree. I'm glad that you don't look down on me because I still like to eat bacon occasionally. <laughs> do you have to 
do you have to make this an expletive podcast now that I said bacon? <laughs> do you have to have the E beside it? I don't know. I, I also I don't think Spotify will they won't accept that. We'll bleep it out. It's not a swear. Yeah, maybe you should. It's not a real swear word. <laughs> That's great, man. I love to hear that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. What are great job? So, a lot of people from the outside who are looking at this movement, like they're just a bunch of crazy people. They're a bunch of and I, we, I had the privilege of going on a trip with you where we filmed a lot of podcast sessions similar to this and got to meet a lot of people. So I would say that my exposure is more than the average person of meeting other people that are in the tour movement. And a lot of them are great. Um, they're great, very sincere individuals. What would you say to the people that are viewing this from the outside? And they're like, they're a bunch of crazies. They live in the hills, some of them homestead. Um, they all don't eat bacon or they don't celebrate Christmas. I guess, what, what would you say to somebody who is mainstream and not Torah observant, if that's their interpretation of some of what we've discussed? I would say, well, there's a lot of good in a lot of that, like mm -hmm. homesteading and, yeah. and, and creating, like, this is going to be a diatribe, so I'm trying to avoid it. <laughs> but to, to, I'm going to avoid it completely. But okay. there's good in that too. But besides that, no one looking into this need to emulate anyone else who's doing it. That's mm. one of the coolest things about this mo movement is that there's no figurehead. There's no pope here. There's mm. no corporate body of um, Baptists, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. There's no diocese. So it's the good and the bad. The fact is that it's the Wild West in this movement because... Mm. People have totally different beliefs in this. Mm -hmm. The general guiding force is that they think the Torah is relevant to our modern lives. Mm -hmm. But besides that, there's people in there's people from Australia to to Alaska to New York City to you know Japan that are doing this stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's all sorts of lifestyles that may not be the mainstream for the Torah or yeah, whatever, yeah. or what we saw, especially in the Ozarks. But um, it, what other people are doing is irrelevant. Well, the only thing that's relevant is what the person looking into this believes and thinks is true. Mm -hmm. And if they're convinced and think that this may be true, then I just encourage them to look into it and, and read the word. That's it. The word will speak for itself. Mm -hmm. I told you that story about the island of Pitcairn and how those guys found this Bible. It was the mutiny on the bounty of rebellion. And I mean, and they killed the captain, I think, and then they took the ship, they landed on Pitcairn, and they had never read the Bible, and they read the captain's Bible after killing him. And they, uh, they came to belief some, somewhat similar to what we believe, specifically that Saturday is the Sabbath. And so I think that some of what this is, is trying to get rid of any preconceived ideas or traditions that may have come with inherited religion. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what a lot of people in this movement will say. But they say it so much that it doesn't mean anything anymore. But what it means really is if you found the Bible on the island of Pitcairn, what would you believe? And so I hope that everyone in this honestly is just doing that. Yeah. Probably that murder is wrong after we just killed our captain. <laughs> yeah, like, what uh -oh. a terrible thing. <laughs> Whoops. We made an oversight. <laughs> Maybe he was a really bad captain. Maybe I need to watch was. that movie with Max. <laughs> it was an old school Okay, one. I need to check it out. We should watch that. Yeah. Thing. What would you say, Luke, if, if this movement eventually does have a diocese or if there is a pope, would you say that the movement has lost its way? Goodness, that's a crazy question. That's a hard question. <laughs> God, possibly, I'm so glad I ask it. That's possibly, possibly. I think that the greatest thing about this movement is that it's led by the Holy Spirit. Mm. I mean, and it, that's my opinion, of course. And, mm. and, and seeing Katie having the dream to help bolster my belief of that. Mm. And then seeing that there's no figurehead helps bolster my belief of that. Yeah. So I do think that this is an awakening that is a... Um, what is the word that everyone uses? A revival. Okay. I think that it's the revival that's happening now. Hmm. But because God is guiding it, it's staying under the radar and is even... <sighs> uh, 
rejected by the majority of, of believers. Hmm. I think it doesn't matter if the majority of believers accept or, or reject. What matters is that Yah has his perfect timing. I think there's a reason that in around the 1500s, he revealed to the Christian world that um, they shouldn't be burning incense to idols, mm -hmm. saying prayers to Mary, and mm -hmm. these sort of things, and, and created the Protestant Reformation. Yeah. And I think for the same reason, which must be tied to his timeline for humanity, mm -hmm. is that he's now waking people up to a second Reformation of mm. of just all of it is getting back to what people were doing in the first century. Yeah. What the people who knew Jesus were doing. And so that's what people in this movement, I hope, are trying to do. That's what I'm trying to do. And I know that's what Calvin and all those guys were trying to do as well. So I don't know why it happens in this way, time-wise, but I know that it is happening. Hmm. What, what do you think that looks like? What, if this is another revival, or if it is a reformation or whatever that is, what do you think that that looks like? Do you think that the mainstream public knows, or is it something that they're blinded by or immune to if there is a second awakening? It hasn't looked like Asbury Street or whatever, if I'm saying that right. It hasn't looked like that. Know. It hasn't looked like a lot of these flash in the pan revivals. Yeah. It has looked like people in the middle of nowhere reading the Bible and thinking and realizing with weirdly at the same time around the world over the same course of several dozen years mm -hmm. that the same thing on their own. Yeah. Which is crazy. That's why I say it's a Holy Spirit led thing because it seems to be happening in a disparate way. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's its strength. And I think that's, that's just what it is. Yeah. For some reason, that was his plan. Okay. So it looks very... I, th I think that in modern day, we view revival as like, it's big, it's crazy, it's wild. Like, I even remember, gosh, like years ago, I think that there was a revival in Lakeland, Florida. And I do this because I don't know how legit it is. I mean, I believe that there was a pastor at that point in time, like, in order to heal people of their illness or release the demons from them was like kicking people in the face. So maybe different, different than that, I suppose. It's definitely different than that. Yeah. <laughs> but that sells loop. <laughs> maybe we should start but doing that. Maybe right? you should. No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting the things that people, anyway, whatever, I won't go into that, but. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that it's not that. I love mm. that it's not geologically singular. Yeah. I love that it's geo geographically, sorry, geographically singular. I love that it's geographically dispersed. Mm. I love that there's people around the entire world that are realizing this now and changing their lives. Mm -hmm. And the craziest thing is that they're changing their lives in the face of opposition because most of these people have been believers. Mm -hmm. And that's what the movie The Way was about. It was about, yeah. oh my gosh, my whole family are Baptists or my father is the pastor or whatever it is and now I'm disowned or I'm in some way suffering. Mm. But I'm doing it because I believe that God wants me to do it. That's what it all boils down to. I mean, people went to the cross to burn, you know, to the stake to burn because they thought God wanted them to do something. And I think it's the same thing with this. Yeah. So if it's what he wants them to do, it'll just continue to increase and proliferate and more believers around the world will wake up and, to this and be like, yeah, I think that living that way is how Jesus was living. Mm -hmm. And so I should do it too. So let's say there is a revival and more people are exposed to this way of thinking and this becomes the predominant religion around the entire world, how is the world better if the majority of humans are now observing these laws versus the current state of humanity? I know that that's like, that is a social question. It's a political question. They're like, there's a lot intertwined there. So I'm not expecting you to go on a three hour diatribe of what that looks like. But if you could describe just what you think 
humanity in general, how it would be different and why it would be better. Sure, I will. Because there are blessings and curses in the Torah, in the words of God. He says, I give you this day, I sent before you this day, a law. And I will bless you if you do it, and I'll curse you if you don't do it. And then he, he lists the blessings that he'll give you, and he lists the curses that he'll give you. And so if everyone was doing this, the world would be so much better because everyone would be blessed. Mm. It would be, it's very interesting, blessed is such a vague word that doesn't, that's come to mean nothing in our society. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's my father-in-law. <laughs> oh, Pop Pop, he has to wait. <laughs> Pop Pop, I'll call you back. Oh, I'm sorry. Your phone was off, but mine wasn't. I know, I made an adjustment of mine to make sure it was off. You're the man. You're two <laughs> steps ahead. See, if everyone were doing this, they would be two steps ahead. They would, they would have okay. turned their, their phone off. But, okay, so can I give an example? My gosh, there's so many examples. It's insane. If we were running our country the way that the Torah runs the country, mm -hmm. then there would be almost no one in prison, mm. and that would be a good thing. People will, would have made restitution. Like if they stole something, they would pay it back five times. And they wouldn't be rotting in prison. Hmm. So, and if people did something that was beyond the pale, evil, like we, yeah. we talked to Bear yeah. about, mm -hmm. then they would be killed. Yeah. And thus society would be improved. So, so the whole world would improve to such an extent that it would be more like heaven on earth. And that's why when my belief and what the, I think the Bible describes is when Jesus comes back to earth, mm -hmm. he will rule according to the laws that he wrote down back then. Okay. So since he's going to use those to rule societally, and they did use those back in the day to rule societally, mm -hmm. then, I mean, those are great social laws. Yeah. So you mentioned, like, without saying the words capital punishment, a lot of people would take this perspective of, God's a God of mercy, of grace, peace. Why would we ever believe in capital punishment if that's the way that things are supposed to be done? Yes. yes. So, so mean, what, do you, what do you say to somebody that's like, no, God is a God of forgiveness, of second chances. He would never be for capital punishment. And he is a God of forgiveness and second chances. And he is the same God who came as a man and said, if your brother hits you in the cheek, turn the other cheek. But before that, he said, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But today I tell you, if your brother hits you in the cheek, then turn your other cheek. And, and this sort of thing that he says, which he says often, he'll say, you have heard it said, but today I tell you, a lot. And when he does that, a lot of the mainstream believers will say, that's him like trumping the Torah and showing a more spiritual view of the Torah. And it's also him basically saying, you don't need to do the eye for eye, tooth for tooth thing now. Now you just do the cheek thing. Mm. He's replacing it. And so that's part of the undertow, I guess, of, of the doctrine of mainstream Christianity. Mm -hmm. Now, how could that make sense if he is the creator mm -hmm. and he said an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, and then he is the creator and he came as a man and said, um, uh, no. Not mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Now this. So uh, most of <laughs> most theology and theses and things like that, I think, I mean, a lot of it is to do with solving that conundrum. Mm -hmm. And that way you can make sense of Paul, make sense of Jesus, make sense of all of it in light of the Old Testament as well. Yeah. Okay. I say they all work together. I say they must work together because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he doesn't change. So how can they both work together? Mm -hmm. If someone hits you in the face, you can forgive them and not press charges against them. But there must be, in society, in God's society, in theocracy rather, there must be the understanding that if you stab out someone's eye, you will have to pay your eye. Mm. There must be that understanding so that there's protections for the people in that society. Okay. It's just like you could call it, 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 
it's even close to libertarianism where it's, yeah. but even though it has punishment because it's protecting the people within the society. Yeah. So how can I say capital punishment should even happen? Because the Bible said that there should, that, that it should happen, but not that's the cop out. So I'll go further than that. I'll okay, try and please do. I'll try and explain why. Oh goodness. Because if you let a kid, a guy rape a kid, or rape a woman, and then you give him six years in prison, and then he gets out and rapes another woman or kid, then you have a, a, the continuing problem. But if you want to protect those women and those children, and you found out that this guy has done that bad thing, you have to kill that guy. You have to remove him from society to protect the good actors in society. So that's my like just philosophical argument for why it says, if you commit adultery, if you murder, if you do a list of other things, then you must be removed from society. The reason, the philosophical reason from my perspective, is that it protects the people in that society. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do this enough, then more of those people will be in your society voting if they haven't become incarcerated already mm -hmm. and changing the fabric of your country further and further away from the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. So Yeshua's prayer to us before he left was, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so ruling the earth the way that he would rule is much closer to what the Torah is doing than mm -hmm. what we're doing now. Yeah. So the Torah will show you how he would rule mm -hmm. in general. I'm sure he would, I mean, it doesn't write everything. Yeah. But but it would give you the ideas. Okay. So that's my argument for capital punishment. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate you sharing because I think that a lot of times when somebody is trying to marry a religion to their lifestyle, it is important to think about like how politically, like what are the standards for this and how does this work? What would you say, Luke, to, and again, I am not a politician. I don't know world politics. I don't know standards of the world, but it seems like from the average person's perspective, a lot of countries that uphold capital punishment in this sense are worse off in a lot of ways than, let's say, American society. Maybe it's your more, I guess that people would say a more primitive society, or maybe it's a more even, um, I don't know, a diabolical society that is willing to take somebody who has committed a sin, let's say adultery, and like stone them in their streets that seems like such a harsh way to deal with that sin. I think that a lot of people would struggle from, yeah, from just observing that as like, well, that's the punishment. You got to pay the piper. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Let me have a drink of water. <laughs> Knowing that, all of his laws are good is important. How mm. do you know that they're all good? My gosh. They all lead to life, even the death ones. <laughs> even, please, please elaborate. <laughs> even the fat, so the, the, the fa Warm yourself up. <laughs> You're protecting the good people. I'm back to that, I yeah. mean, on the capital punishment. Yeah. So you said, oh, I know why. They're doing it wrong. That's okay. why it's barbaric. Okay. That's okay. why it's horrific. Okay. But the word says this. It says the other <laughs> it says the other nations will look at you and they'll notice these laws and they will say, This is a great and wise people. Hmm. Okay. So the way that he has written capital punishment, the way that he has written all the rest of the other things that aren't like killing people yeah. are all fair. Yeah. They're all just. Mm. And without fairness and justice, then they're... It's so funny. There's this whole social justice thing going yeah, on. Yeah. But it's social justice not from a sovereign mm. moral perspective. It's not from God's view. Okay. There should be wonderful social justice. Yeah. But that social justice would help protect the people that are wronged by people that are allowed to run around free in this country. Yeah. So 
I would just say, yes, there are countries that are killing people and they're doing it barbaric and they're worse off than this westernized country. Yeah. But they're, they're, they're doing it wrong. Okay. And the, technically, this westernized country would be much better off if it were enacting all of the rules in the word. Yeah. I mean, there would be much less people needlessly in prison, rotting, and spending tons of cash, like costing us taxpayers so much money. Yeah. If, if, if the rules in the, in the word were upheld. Yeah. Hmm. And so if we, we can zoom in on any one of those rules and, and look it up in the Bible, and, and the best response will be already written there in the Bible. That's what I'm convinced of and a lot of people in this movement. Okay. Hmm. To go back to where we first started the conversation, Luke, you have this understanding of Christmas and what it's supposed to be or what it's not supposed to be. How do you find yourself as an evolved individual in, in thinking about this? And I, just, it starts there. If you could summarize, I guess, where you are right now, where would you say that you are right now in this belief system? We've talked, obviously, like people are aware of some of your ideas, but I think that that's a more you, Luke, like a personal question of where you find yourself right now as being Torah observant. And you've come a long ways from just realizing that, oh, maybe Christmas is being done wrong. Where do you find yourself now? I guess... In many ways, I'm in the same way as I was when I first started pursuing God with all my heart, soul, and might mm -hmm. in New York when I was in Times Square Church mm -hmm. in their praise mm -hmm. part. And I walked out of the building before anyone spoke. It was just after the praise, and I felt the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I left the building. And I thought, and I saw, I told you about this. My vision physically changed, and I looked like I was seeing through orange glasses instead mm -hmm. of regular mm -hmm. vision it was very weird mm -hmm. but that was another spiritual event that happened yeah. to me and that's after i decided to follow him with all my heart soul mm -hmm. and might and cut away anything that was not of him yeah and i hope that i maintain that way of walking out my life mm -hmm. forever yeah i just want to do that and if i ever believe or notice that i'm doing something that's wrong then I will recant and I will turn <laughs> my, from my wicked ways. Yeah. But I have been convinced since that time that following the laws in the Bible are the way that Jesus lived and told us to live. And so that's why I am doing this and will probably keep doing this okay. until I've proven otherwise. Yeah. And I'd happy to talk to anyone about it. And I mean, a lot of people have reached out to me about it and I've had the usually honor to discuss these things at length yeah, yeah no i think that's great i because you are a very approachable person and i apologize that my dog has all of a sudden made his grand appearance in the past five or so minutes he likes hanging out this is what you get when you have a a cast that is only selfish in nature <laughs> he's very yeah. calm and awesome most of the time <laughs> but he apparently had to get a drink of water and get some scratches where would you suggest people start, Luke? If, the, if there is somebody that's really curious about this and they say, I just want to know, give me some guidance on where do I first start in uncovering some of this, like, if it is something I'm curious about, it seems awfully daunting to even know where to start. Where do you start? I would say it's very important to just read the whole Bible. The whole Bible from mm -hmm. beginning to end, Genesis to Revelation. Mm -hmm. Why is that so yeah. important? Explain again, being naive, explain that to me. Why would that be so important in the start of this journey? Because I believe that the Bible is the story of man. Mm -hmm. And I think that it will reveal the hero's journey of mankind that started in a state of perfection in the Garden of Eden. And will once again, as is prophesied, and in a state of perfection, renewed and back with God. Mm -hmm. And that, that journey of man is beautiful, and it has this climax, and it's exciting, and it gives you a purpose in life. And 
And I think as you read that journey from beginning to end, Mm -hmm. you'll realize that you are part of God's family if you believe in him and believe in his son and are saved through his blood. You're part of his family and he loves you and he wants the best for you. And he wants you to, he want, and he told you the best way to live. And so he also wrote that out ad nauseum or whatever mm. yeah. in, in the words of, of the first five books of the Bible. Mm. And so anyone who's interested in this, just read Genesis to Revelation and you'll see Israel throughout. You'll see the law throughout. You'll see, um, you'll see grace throughout. You'll see love throughout. It's like God doesn't shift at the beginning of the New Testament. From this evil God to this kind, loving yeah. God. Yeah. It's always grace. It's always love. Mm. And that's even why he made us, mm. from my perspective. So, so read the Bible. I mean, they can read the truth book too, yeah, but the sure, Bible's sure. really the place. Sure. So that's if the person who is curious. What is the fate of the person who's like, I don't really care. I don't really care about this. I don't think it applies to me. About the Bible in general? Um, or about Torah? Let's just say Torah. Is let's it say, a let's Christian? Say, let's say I'm a Christian. Okay. And I say, don't really care. I'm not going to observe Torah. I like my bacon. I like Sundays. I'm certainly not going to stop and pulling people on sundown at Friday to Saturday at sundown. What becomes of that person? I would just ask the person... Are they putting 21st century convenience over what they truly believe? Are they putting convenience over what they think God wants? Or do they just think he doesn't want this? What if their answer was yes, I'm putting convenience over this? Oh my gosh. I would say don't do that. <laughs> but what is, I guess that I'm asking like from, from somebody who observes the Torah and the laws, is there, do I have a fate if I'm saying I'm aware but I'm choosing convenience? And do they consider themselves a Christian? Yeah, that's, that's for argument's sake. To make it interesting, let's say yes. So they're knowingly rebelling against yeah, yeah, yeah. at least a few little things. Yeah. I would just say it's a fearful place to be. Mm. It's a fearful place to be. If you believe that there's a creator and you believe that he told you to do something and you decided not to do it and snub him. I would say that the reason it's fearful is the same reason it's fearful to disobey your father if he tells you to do something and you know he in no uncertain terms that he wants you to do it. And also if you know that your father is smart and loving and that he rewards those who diligently seek him, which mm-hmm. is what God is. Yeah. So if you know that this creator being, this father, is smart, he's loving, and he, he rewards those who diligently seek him, and then you choose to snub him, then you're just hurting yourself, is what yeah. I would say. Yeah. I would say, if you really believe he's good, then believe he's good and, and act the way that you believe. Mm. So I think that that's what I would say. Mm. Beautifully said. <laughs> I don't know. Are there any other questions that you would like me to ask you? We already talked about grace. Mm-hmm. And law. I think that's really important. I think that's really important, yeah. Because that was one of the things that I think that I knew the least bit about. We talked about salvation and sanctification. Mm-hmm. I think it's important that those things sink in to anyone who's a Christian who's watching this. And yeah. Because that's what most people struggle with telling their friends and family. Mm-hmm. They mostly struggle with them actually registering the fact that they believe that you're saved separate to keeping the law. Yeah. But that the law is how you live like Jesus lived. Yeah. So those are the two most important things. Yeah. I mean, I just hope everyone is having has a great time and I hope that they enjoyed this and I hope yeah. that they follow God with all their heart, soul, and might. Yeah. And they love their neighbor as themselves. Yeah. Those are two greatest commandments that all others hang on yeah. for a reason. Yeah. I know that you're passionate about that. And I know that obviously, Luke, you're you I've never heard you toot your own horn, so to speak. But we we did one of these interviews with somebody, and after the interview, the person that you were interviewing asked me, Nate, how long have you been Torah observant? And I said, I'm not. (laughs) 
And they were kind of like, they, I think that they were a little surprised, but they said to me that says a lot about you, Nate, that you would come on this trip with Luke not being tour observant. And I changed that to, I think that it actually says a great deal about you and the friendship that I have with you and the person that you are. Because to me, it's, I had a lot of fun doing this. I had a lot of fun gallivanting about the Midwest and a little further south doing this. But I think that it is more character and truth to who you are as a person that somebody who does not have a connection with tour observancy would still help you do this project. So if that's of any validation to you, if you decide to put this in the podcast or not, I think that it's important for people to understand the character that you have, that I would sacrifice some of my time to be able to spend time with you and do something that you believe in um, just for whatever that's worth. Here's you're so kind, bro. Thank you. Thanks for going. It couldn't have happened without you. I want you to know that. I was thrilled to be there. We had some good times. We had some really good times. It yeah. Was a blast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess until next time then. Until next time. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah. Glad to be here. You're the man. <laughs> that was good, man. Good job. I that the content was cool.